The man known to history as Muhammad Ahmed was born on the 12th of August in either 1843 or 1844 on a small island in the Nile River at Jazirat Lebab, 10 miles south of Dongola in northern Sudan. His father was Abdallah Fal Abd al-Wali, an artisan who made a living as a boat and water wheel builder, which were in demand from local fishermen, traders and farmers, or clients further afield. At his workyard in the northern point of Labab Island, Abdallah, assisted by his two older sons, Muhammad and Hamid, used curved adz, hand drills, rough iron spikes, and other basic tools to create crude, rugged vessels out of acacia wood adapted for travel on the Nile. However, Abdallah, who adopted the honorific title Al Said, which means the Honorable, was more than just a humble shipwright, as he claimed to be a direct descendant of Ali bin Abi Talib, the son in law of Prophet Muhammad himself. To be Ashraf, or in other words, a blessed ancestor of the house of the Prophet, was a familial connection that Muhammad Ahmed would use to spiritually legitimize his later movement. The name of Muhammad Ahmed's mother is unknown, but it is clear that he held her in high esteem, as upon his victorious conquest of Khartoum, one of his first actions was to pay his respects at her grave located in the city. He had two older brothers, Muhammad and Hamid, and one younger sibling named Abdallah, all of whom would eventually sacrifice themselves to spread his caliphate by the sword, as well as a harem of wives and multiple children he married off to potential allies. This video is brought to you by Enlisted, the amazing World War II multiplayer shooter game. Enlisted features hundreds of firearms and specialized weapons, both common weapons and prototypes, rarely seen in games. The most exciting thing about Enlisted is that it is so authentic and keeps gameplay dynamic with players always in the middle of the action. My favorite vehicle is the Sherman IC Firefly Tank. It makes you feel indestructible. And the best feature of Enlisted is the historical authenticity. Uniforms, equipment, vehicles and locations are all incredibly authentic. Also, there is no purchase necessary. Just follow the link to download and play for free. You will also get a nice bonus when using our link, which gives you three days of premium time and several orders for troops and weapons. Play Enlisted free on PC, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox One and Xbox Series X and Series S. Follow the link to download the game and get your exclusive bonus of three days of premium time and several orders for troops and weapons now. See you in battle. Physically, Mohammed Ahmed was a tall and powerfully built man with good-looking features and a constant knowing smile that revealed a gap between his top front teeth. Usually dressed in the simple patchwork robes of his acolytes, he was an eloquent and persuasive speaker able to communicate with everyone, from lowly rural peasants to educated scholars to high-born statesmen. Ahmed was a very serious and at times overly proud man who sincerely believed he was God's chosen one. Despite having a strong puritanical streak, he was not inherently cruel, being an individual who could display mercy and clemency on occasion, especially towards enemies who converted to his cause. When Ahmed was born in 1844, the town of Dongola was a military camp called Urdi al Manfuch, a sanctuary for Egyptian soldiers who had invaded northern Sudan in 1820 under the leadership of Muhammad Ali Pasha. Pasha presided over an Egyptian kingdom that, while technically a province of the Ottoman Empire, was independent from it in all but name a de facto status that had first been officially established in 1840 following Egyptian victories in the Egyptian-Ottoman Wars 
of the 1830s. Thus, at the time of his birth, the future Mahdi's motherland was merely a satellite territory of Egypt. In 1849, Ahmed's father won a government contract to construct boats for the Egyptian occupation force who, having already subdued the northern and central districts of Sudan, were looking to expand south and west. And so, as a result, Ahmed's family, which included his heavily pregnant mother, moved south to the Sudanese heartland. They settled in the town of Karari, a settlement situated on the west bank of the Nile, south of Omdurman, that was less than a day's journey from Khartoum. En route to their new home, though, Ahmed's father died from a short illness, and from then on, Ahmed's two older brothers, Muhammad and Hamid, became father figures, supporting the household by continuing the family woodworking trade. At Karri, Ahmed's younger brother, named Abdallah in honor of his father, was born at the same time as his older siblings were trying to recruit carpenters for their new business venture. It was in this turbulent period of optimism and heartache that Ahmed, grieving for his deceased father, began devoting himself more to prayer and meditation, setting in motion an extraordinary spiritual journey. The challenge for Ahmed, in becoming more devoted to his Islamic faith, was the lack of teachers in the region. In order to progress, Ahmed had to often venture outside of Karadi for schooling commitments. By all accounts, Ahmed was an exceptionally talented student, with his followers claiming that, by the time he was 11, he had already become a Hafiz, a person who could recite the entire Quran by heart. By the time he was 17, Ahmed had mastered the Quran and was well acquainted with the principles of Sharia law, the sayings and traditions of the Prophet, and Arabic grammar, mathematics, and astronomy. The young student had a thirst for knowledge and was known for regularly studying handwritten manuscripts passed down by his teachers that would shape his political and religious thinking. One of the strongest influences on the young Ahmed were the works of the 13th century legal scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, who believed that the ideal Muslim community should be modeled after the Prophet Muhammad's community at Medina. Taymiyyah argued that the leaders of the Islamic kingdoms had failed in their duty to instill proper religious practice and observance among their citizens. At the time, Taymiyyah had even gone so far as to issue a fatwa against the rulers of Baghdad, denouncing them as apostates that all true Muslims should rise up against, an approach that Ahmed would mirror in his later years. Ahmed was also enamored by the less violent Sufi doctrines that focused on the individual and spiritual relationship that worshippers had with Allah or God. Ahmed studied this idea more deeply when he became a disciple of Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif Nur al-Daim, the Grand Master of a Sufi Brotherhood known as the Samaniya Order based at al Kawa, a small community a hundred miles south of Khartoum. Over the next seven years, Ahmed reflected upon many of the Prophet's acts in his everyday activities being known to recite the Qur'an all night from the end of Asha prayers at 9pm until morning prayers at 4am in a secluded spot, a habit which called to mind Muhammad's own desire to pray in solitude in a cave until he was overcome with revelation. In this period, Ahmed also found time to embark on a more personal enterprise, marrying at 22 years old his first wife, Fatima bint al Hajj Sharif, in 1866, a woman who bore him four daughters that he would marry off to various allies in the future. By 1868, Ahmed's formal spiritual schooling came to an end, and he was inaugurated as a sheikh of the Samania order by his tutor, Sheikh Muhammad, a position that gave him the freedom to travel, the freedom to preach his own message, 
and the freedom to establish his own place of worship. Like many of his class, if he desired, he could also have the opportunity to further pursue his theological training at Al-Azhar in Cairo, a government-ran institution with numerous ulamas who were teachers and interpreters of Islamic religious knowledge. However, inspired by his mystical Sufi education, a disdain for the ruling Egyptian and Ottoman elites, and a preference for the more esoteric side of Islam, Ahmed opted to remain outside of the system and to open up his very own mosque, where he could preach his own message instead of the government's. After asking his colleagues for advice on where to establish the mosque, Ahmed was recommended to go to Jazeera Abba, a densely wooded island three miles wide and 35 miles long, located in the central White Nile region. Over the next couple of years, Ahmed strengthened his relationship with the local rulers and built a community of followers around him there, gifting them with tiny leather lockets containing Quran quotes and personal blessings that were supposed to ward off disease and temptation. As his flock grew, the young sheikh made sure to underline his own family links to the divine by referring to himself as a descendant of the House of the Prophet, which he highlighted by signing off in his correspondence, the son of Al Said Abdullah. However, with his popularity skyrocketing, Ahmed's relationship with his own mentor began to deteriorate as the student outgrew the master. Some have argued that Sheikh Muhammad's attempt to establish a subsidiary branch of his own brand of Sufism at a place close to Jazeera Abba in 1872 greatly incensed his former mentee, who was angered at the encroachment, while others state that their relationship collapsed simply because Sheikh Muhammad was jealous of Ahmed's success. Ahmed was excommunicated from his order and soon joined another branch of the Samaniya order headed by Sheikh al Qureshi, a distinguished and influential mystic with a large following who was 86 years old and had been the favorite student of the Brotherhood's founding father. The future Mahdi marked his switch of allegiance by taking al Qureshi's daughter, al Nima, as his third bride, a union that all but confirmed that Ahmed was to replace al Qureshi as leader when he died. Having put his personal affairs in order, Ahmed embarked on the next phase of his career, leaving his island stronghold to preach his message to the masses in the countryside and on the banks of the River Nile. Accompanied by a delegation of loyal followers, Ahmed was welcomed into the homes and mosques of the Samania order as he implored his audiences, which came from all strata of society, to not only embrace a more orthodox interpretation of Islam, but to fight against abuses committed by the hated central government of Egypt on behalf of their Ottoman overlords. Ahmed bitterly complained about the Ottoman Empire's tax system, an institution pervaded by all forms of corruption, with officials regularly embezzling funds and ransacking the peasantry that served them. Among other things, Ahmed criticized the rapaciousness of money-hungry bureaucrats the fake bills issued to illiterate farmers by scheming clerks, the illicitly weighted scales used by dodgy merchants, and the refusal of avaricious provincial governors to recognize that a cash instalment had been paid. Ahmed also reminded his audiences that the only acceptable tribute that Muslims should pay was the zakat, a traditional tithe that was calculated at 2.5% of excessive income and that any additional taxes levied only served to line the pockets of the occupiers. In July 1878, following the death of his father-in-law and master, Sheikh al Qureshi, the 24-year-old Ahmed became even more powerful when he assumed leadership of the Sufi clan and its sizable community. 
Before long, word of his miraculous powers and his dedication to asceticism had spread, and Ahmed became somewhat of a local celebrity, as curious people from all over the country flocked to the shores of Jazira Abba to witness him speak, while passing captains, eager to ensure a safe voyage, begged for his blessings. Ahmed's crusade for an orthodox religious revival now began to assume overt political undertones as he continued to expand his already wide network of friends, confidants, and allies. And by the start of the new decade, the language in Ahmed's proclamations was becoming increasingly bolder, with the future Mahdi writing in early October 1880 how Nothing is left of Islam but its name, and nothing is left of the Quran but its Arabic script. To those who rejected his arguments and overtures, he reserved particular ire, with Ahmed writing on the 20th of June 1880 how those whom we call to join us and who refuse regret it greatly for with their refusal they incur the displeasure of God, his prophet, and us. Ahmed started making moves in the political arena, marrying the daughter of influential cleric Sheikh Muhammad al tayyib al-Basir, the grandson of the Samania Order's founder, to secure additional support for his movement, which was gradually growing into an open rebellion. Next, Delegations of elders sent by regional tribes such as the Bagara, the Kinana, the Husanat, the Amana, the Duwe, and the Falata made their way to the compound at Jazira Abba to pledge their allegiance, becoming some of Ahmed's earliest and most trusted allies. Before long, he had mustered 20,000 supporters from numerous local tribes, yet his power, compared to that of the government, was still relatively insignificant, compelling him to look further afield at other options. Throughout March 1880, he toured the province of Kordofan, hoping to win the loyalties of the hostile Ja Alin and Bagara clans, whose combined manpower would be crucial to any successful uprising. As a member of the Dongolawai tribe, persuading the Ja Alien to join his cause was extremely easy in comparison to the Bagara, who were largely cattle herding nomads inhabiting vast swathes of land in Goddofan and Darfur, and who had been traditionally viewed with suspicion by other indigenous groups. Employing his irrepressible charisma, however, Ahmed was able to solicit the friendship of many leading Bagara dignitaries on his return leg through eastern Kordofan, an impressive feat that showed how Ahmed could maneuver around pre-existing tribal rivalries in a skillful manner. On the other hand, Ahmed's charm could only go so far, with the pro-government Shagir, Shukriya, and Tagali groups remaining unconvinced and loyal to their Ottoman and Egyptian benefactors. After finishing up the tour, Ahmed dedicated himself to more personal endeavors, overseeing the construction of a tomb for his late master, Sheikh al Qureshi, at the close of 1880. It was here that he was approached by Abdullahi Muhammad Turshain al Taishi. A lanky man with a great beard and thin pointed face who had traveled from the western reaches of Kordofan to meet him. Sharing a similar background and outlook, the pair immediately hit it off, and before long they became trusted companions. As, like the many others who flocked to the island of Jazira Abba, Abdullahi was convinced that the holy man he had sought was the Mahdi. In Islamic theology, the Mahdi is a divinely guided deliverer and administrator of justice tasked with restoring the true path of Islam at the end of the world. Deriving from an honor given to the Prophet Muhammad and his four deputies, the Khulufa al-Rashidun, the title was first used in 685 AD, but was experiencing a resurgence of 
use as Muhammad Ahmed's influence skyrocketed. Being the Islamic year of 1297 in 1880, many Muslims thought that the new century would also mark the end of the world and the appearance of the Mahdi, a belief that caused many to seek out Muhammad Ahmed. It was these developments and encouragement from his followers that first caused Muhammad Ahmed to internally debate whether he was, in fact, the prophesied Mahdi. While receptive contemporary attitudes were certainly one source of inspiration for him adopting such a hallowed title, many of Ahmed's disciples believe that the relationship he shared with his loyal follower, Abdullahi Muhammad Tershain al Taishi, had a much greater impact. Throughout the month building the tomb at Masalamiya, the friendship between the two men had flourished to such an extent that Ahmed had even given Abdullahi the privilege of carrying one of his banners inscribed with verses from the Quran, a move that caused resentment among his followers who were jealous of the special treatment afforded to a relatively new initiate. At Jazeera Abba, his acolytes were further incensed when Abdullahi was settled into a simple straw hut right beside their master's accommodation, marking him as a member of Ahmed's inner circle. As such, many believed that the arrival of Abdullahi and the deep love he professed for his master were the main reasons why Ahmed recognized himself as the Mahdi. Some, however, insist that Ahmed had been contemplating the issue for a much longer time and that his decision to be the Mahdi was less immediate. They point to the fact that before he met Abdullahi, Ahmed had visited all of his previous mentors, asking each whether he was the prophesied one. Ahmed even briefly considered the possibility that Muhammad al-Mahdi al-Sanusi head of the Samania order in the northern Sahara region was the true Mahdi. Nevertheless, retreating to a secluded spot by the river without food or water, he is said to have meditated there for several days, after which, emerging dazed and weak, he proclaimed, I am empty, I am powerless, but I have received an order from Allah through his prophet I am al-Mahdi al-Muntazar. Intense and protracted spells of meditation and prayer, during which he claimed to have many personal audiences with the Prophet Muhammad himself, only confirmed his divine status. In March 1881, Ahmed informed his closest companions, including Abdullahi, of his true form revealing his final revelation publicly on the 29th of June, 1881. Following his announcements, he likely was aware of the new and terrifying floodgate he had opened, for in claiming to be the Mahdi, he was automatically rejecting not only the mandate of the orthodox ulama, the highest Islamic religious authorities, but also the very power of the Ottoman Empire itself. Imitating the Prophet Muhammad's example, Ahmed began appointing deputies, with his ten-year-old son-in-law, Muhammad al-Sharif, chosen so military support could be mustered from the Berber, Jazeera and Dongola regions, as was Ali Wadhalu, an influential chieftain of the Dighaim and Kinana clans of the Bagara, who could supply a steady stream of warriors from their ranks. Unsurprisingly, Ahmed's most senior deputy was Abdullahi Muhammad Tershain al Taishi, a man that he had only known for seven months who could marshal the Taishi and Rizega clans to his cause. For his last deputy, he looked further afield, offering the position to Muhammad al Mahdi al Sanusi, the chieftain of the Sanusiya who inhabited the northern Sahara area and someone Ahmed had briefly suspected of being the Mahdi, but his offer was rejected. 
Meanwhile, Muhammad Ahmed's extraordinary claim certainly ruffled the feathers of the government administration in Khartoum, which, until then, had only viewed him as nothing more than a harmless upstart. Ahmed's declaration was now treated with the utmost seriousness by the local authorities headed by Governor General Muhammad Abd al Rauf, a former general of the Egyptian army who were shocked by how many tribal elders from Jazira and Kordofan had come out in support of the young religious leader. In response, the Governor General dispatched a force to Jazira Abba to open dialogue with the Mahdi, but his overtures were rejected and his men were ambushed and murdered. In the aftermath, sensing that Jazira Abba was far too exposed, Ahmed commanded his flock to take flight to the hills of southern Kordofan, knowing that the remoteness would be of considerable advantage to him. His move to establish a headquarters deep in the countryside, where he could expect support and provisions from sympathetic locals, gave him a significant advantage over the enemy, for he knew that any governmental force sent to exact revenge would have to contend with a range of insurmountable logistical and environmental challenges. In contrast to the rebels, who travelled lightly, were extremely mobile, and were adapted to the local environment, governmental soldiers would be bogged down by equipment, forced to drag heavy artillery pieces over difficult terrain, and whittled down by unfamiliar diseases as they hopelessly maneuvered themselves around a region they knew hardly anything about. After 79 grueling days on the road, the group arrived at Jebel Gadir to receive a warm welcome from its sympathetic chieftain, Mek Nazir, who promptly started constructing accommodation and a mosque for his new charges. Finally given an opportunity to rest, the Mahdists were now settled on a hill which was renamed Jebel Massa, in accordance with the Quran, which foretold that the Mahdi would appear on earth in a place with that particular name, while his followers were now stylized as Ansar, a broad and unifying term designed to downplay and overcome the tribal rivalries within his flock. After a couple of months of respite, however, the Mahdists were forced to return to battle with the news that the governor of Fashoda, Rashid Aiman, without the approval of Khartoum, was en route to Jebel Massa with two companies of 400 soldiers. Aiman, though, was at an immediate disadvantage, since a covert network of Mahdist spies informed Muhammad Ahmed of his every move, making a surprise attack impossible. On the morning of the 8th of December 1881, the governor's force was annihilated by the Mahdists, who, fueled by religious zeal and the glory of martyrdom, slaughtered Aiban and 111 of his comrades at the cost of 30 Ansar lives. Ahmed's victory not only provided him with a considerable windfall of weapons and equipment, but encouraged many previously undecided factions Amazed by the Mahdists' victory, and perhaps by rumours that the Mahdi had turned Egyptian bullets into water, to rally to the Nuba Mountains to join his cause. In addition to being collectively referred to as Ansar, internal cohesion was further fostered by the introduction of mandatory attire, namely the jiba, a patchwork smock that blurred tribal lines as well as the institution of compulsory communal prayers known as ratib, chanted meditations that were written down by hand and distributed to the faithful. Presided over a militia that numbered several thousand and which was divided into three regiments, with the Bagara fighting under the black flag, the Kenana and the Dighaim under the green flag and the peoples of Jazira and the Mahdi's own kinsmen adopting the red flag. Because Ahmed viewed the firearms scavenged from the Turks as impure, these makeshift battalions, also bolstered by rudimentary cavalry units and decked out in chain mail armor, were only permitted 
to be armed with swords, spears, and throwing knives. As a result of the Mahdi's insistence, in composition, these contingents were effectively a medieval army equipped with medieval equipment, a choice that was to initially put them at great disadvantage in combat. Meanwhile, back in Khartoum, Mohammed Raouf bitterly complained that Rashid Ayman had disobeyed his order, leaving him with no choice but to ask officials in Cairo for reinforcements. Yet his request was never carried out, and instead he was replaced by Major General Abd al-Qadir Hilmi on the 16th of February 1882. Hilmi was originally from Homs in the Ottoman province of Syria, who had most recently fought in Egypt's war with Abyssinia between 1875 and 1876. It took the appointee several weeks to start the job, as he was first required to stop off in Cairo, meaning that in the interval an acting governor-general was installed. The position was given to Karl Geiger, a tall German with a red beard who was so confident in his ability that he believed, with all the available manpower at his disposal, he could quickly crush the Mahdist rebellion by launching a huge offensive at the Ansar's mountain lair, supported by smaller assaults on Mahdist supporters in Jazeera. With this strategy, Geiger first found success at the town of Senna that had been besieged by Mahdist forces since the early spring of 1882, where a government company, pretending to switch allegiances, was granted access inside by the rebels, who were then all promptly sprayed with bullets. The German commander also emerged victorious near the town of Abu Haraz, where, leading a 2,500-strong militia of anti mahdist Shukriya tribesmen, he routed the rebel armies and rather gruesomely had the head of the rebel leader, Ahmad Taha, removed and sent to Khartoum to be placed on a spike in the marketplace. Following these events, Geiger's regiment was put under the command of Brigadier Yusuf Hassan al-Shalali, a veteran soldier of Sudanese descent who was tasked with organizing and launching the attack against the Mahdist stronghold at Jebel Gadir. Setting out on the 4th of May 1882, the march to Jebel Gadir took three long and exhausting weeks, during which several Mahdist spies were captured and brutally executed by al-Shalali, who ordered that their arms and legs be cut off one by one in front of the entire army. The two forces eventually clashed in the early morning hours of the 30th of May in what would be a stunning victory for the Mahdists, who, having concealed themselves under cover of darkness, launched a devastating surprise attack on government troops as they lay sleeping. Shalali's men, awoken by the screams of vengeful jihadists, were swarmed and overwhelmed, while those who managed to escape were gleefully hunted down by the Ansar. At the Battle of Massa, Ahmed dealt his first major blow to the Khartoum authorities and formally established the Mahdist state, but at a great cost, for 200 of his Ansar had died defending it, including his own brother, Hamid. A few days later, on the 2nd of June, Geiger was formally replaced as Governor-General by Major General Abd al-Qadir Hilmi, who abandoned the risky search-and-destroy operations favoured by his predecessors and set out his own three-pronged strategy that emphasised defensive military employment, a propaganda offensive and covert efforts to assassinate the Mahdi. Throughout Sudan, Egyptian defences were bolstered and reinforced, such as in Khartoum, where five forts were installed with guns and regular patrols covering day and night were instituted. On the propaganda front, Hilmi appealed to the patriotism of government loyalists, such as the Shukriya, the Kababish and the Dabaina, promising them exemption from tax for a year and offering them money for the capture of Mahdist insurgents and chiefs. The Governor-General also liaised with the Ulama, 
particularly Sheikh al-Amin Muhammad al-Dariye, the distinguished chief of Sudanese ulama, to wage an ideological war against the many pamphlets, letters and proclamations of the Mahdi through the publishing of three manifestos that painted him as an impostor. Finally, various methods of assassination were discussed by Hilmi and his officers, who considered everything from poisoned dates, murder squads and dynamite-packed envelopes as they drew up their plans, although none of these were ever properly attempted. In the late summer of 1882, as his enemies plotted his downfall, Muhammad Ahmed, looking to build upon his earlier triumphs, commanded his rebel army, which now had as many as 50,000 men, to march on Obeid, a town renowned for its commercial wealth, with a garrison of 6,000 men that, if taken, could serve as a strategic staging post for an assault of Khartoum itself. After establishing a temporary base at Kaba, a small settlement six miles from Obeid, many local chieftains and dignitaries switched allegiances to the Mahdi, while those who did not support him joined the garrison or fled east to Khartoum. As the rebel forces approached Obeid, their leader presented its townsfolk, terrified by tales of sword-wielding Mahdists suicidally running headlong into gunfire, with the same choice, join or die. On the morning of Friday the 8th of September, just after dawn prayers, the Mahdist forces brandishing spears and swords launched a full-scale assault of Obeid, but since the defenders were armed with guns and were firing from rooftop positions, the rebels began to be picked off one by one. Matters went from bad to worse when a regiment commanded by the Mahdi's brother Muhammad penetrated the walls, causing a fresh wave of Obeid defenders to suddenly emerge from hiding and to fire down upon them, a surprise attack that caused a bloodbath. By the end of the first day, around 10,000 Mahdists had either been killed or wounded including the Mahdi's remaining brothers Muhammad and Abdullah and his nephew Ahmad, all of whom had been mown down from the Obeid rooftops, while some of the movement's most senior figureheads had been shot dead. However, with the Mahdi's forces now whittled down and weakened, government forces failed to press home their advantage, with General Muhammad Said, who had lost 288 men in the ordeal, ordering his men to stay protected inside the city walls. It was this type of cautionary inaction that gave the rebels time to prepare an alternative strategy that would transform the engagement into a lengthy and protracted affair, for the Mahdi now decided that a drawn-out siege of Obeid was the best course of action. Stocked with a large hoard of food and provisions, for the first few months, the defenders managed with little difficulty, but as winter passed and a new year dawned, supplies started to dwindle, and before long, the soldiers and citizens of Obeid were so starving that they were eating palm tree fibers, gum, skins, and leather, as the enemy Mahdists outside the walls remained well-fed and adequately supplied. In addition to being ravenous, the Obeid defenders were also constantly harried by fire from Ansar snipers equipped with weapons that Muhammad Ahmed, who now saw the advantages that guns could bring to the table, brought in from his stockpile at Jebel Ghadir. On the 19th of January 1883, with only 3,500 of the original 6,000 defenders left, Obeid officially fell to the Ansar becoming an operational base from which they could strike west into Darfur, south into Bar al-Ghazal, and northeast towards Khartoum. In the aftermath, the town was sacked of all its wealth, and leading townspeople that didn't submit to Ahmed were executed, while no fewer than 6,000 rifles were seized, and many government commanders converted to the cause infusing the ramshackle Mahdist ranks 
with worrying new levels of professionalism. Surprisingly, the news that a small alliance of tribes in provincial Sudan had managed to conquer Obeid was met with very little interest by the central government in Cairo, which had much more pressing concerns. By the beginning of the 1880s, Egypt had been in the grips of a disastrous economic crisis that had driven down the wages of citizen and soldier alike, with many Egyptian officers in the army either being dismissed or having their promotion prospects curtailed. The country's financial woes were compounded by British and French creditors that had exercised considerable influence in Sudan since the reign of the previous Khedev Ismail, who, upon his accession in 1863, had opened up Egypt to foreign powers in a bid to Europeanize his empire. It was unwanted foreign interference, coupled with the Khedev's own unchallenged autocratic authority, that had prompted the creation of oppositional political parties such as Hizb al-Watani, the National Party, which had denounced Ismail as nothing more than a despotic puppet of the British and French, both of which had considerable money invested in the Suez Canal that had been built to connect the Mediterranean with the Red Sea. The desperate situation remained pretty much unaltered under Ismail's successor, Khedev Tawfiq, who, after taking power in 1879, was left with the unenviable task of negotiating the power balance between the British and French on the one hand, and the army on the other. As a result of this discontent, in February 1882, the Khedev was dispossessed of his authority by the Egyptian military who installed Ahmed Arabi, a colonel of the 4th Regiment with strong nationalist leanings, as the Minister of War of a revamped cabinet dead set on reducing the influence of the great powers in their domestic affairs. On the 11th of June 1882, 50 foreign nationals were killed in a wave of deadly riots that caused thousands of foreigners to flee the country. Fanning the flames were the ulama, who, after proclaiming Tawafiq an apostate for prioritizing the needs of Christians over Muslims, declared jihad against all foreigners. With their financial interests and citizens threatened by civil strife, on the 12th of July 1882, after a bombardment of Alexandria by the Royal Navy that left much of the city in ruins, the British landed their first troops on Egyptian shores, later establishing more firm control with the defeat and exile of Ahmad Arabi, who was sent far away to British Ceylon or modern-day Sri Lanka. Having removed a dangerous rebel from the picture, Tawafiq's power was reinstated and reinforced by the British, who, unsure of how long it would take them to re-establish order in the Egyptian realm, maintained his position using their military might, for the Khedif had no popular support and was widely reviled. Up until this point, years of political turmoil in Cairo meant that developments in Sudan had been largely neglected, which in turn had allowed the Mahdi to wage his campaign with very little pushback from the central government itself. However, following the rebel victory at Obeid and Khedif Tawfiq's insistence that the stability of his realm could only be achieved with the reconquest of his provincial backwater, by the start of 1883, Sudan was becoming a focal point for the British, who undertook their first fact-finding mission to the region in January. Meanwhile, at Obeid, Muhammad Ahmed now revealed the extent of his ambitions vowing that in future his flock would be able to pray at mosques as widely spaced apart as Cairo, Khartoum, Mecca, Medina and even Jerusalem in a proclamation that showed that he was intent on overthrowing not only the Ottoman Empire but the entirety of the Islamic world which he envisioned would be united under his banner. In Cairo, with the blessings of Khedif Tawafiq, and with minimal support from the British, 
An expeditionary force was assembled to take back control of the administrative centers of the Kordofan region where Muhammad Ahmed now reigned supreme. Leading this motley crew of men, many of whom had been suddenly reinstated back into military service after being disbanded in disgrace as part of Ahmed Arabi's militia, was Colonel William Hicks, a tall and handsome 53-year-old British officer and soldier of fortune who had found his way to Egypt after finishing active service towards the end of the 1860s. Appointed Major General, by Hadith Tawfiq, the British government were quick to clarify that Hicks did not represent their interests and that his participation did not imply any sort of official endorsement of the mission. Despite some misgivings, low resources, and the fact that Hicks himself had personal doubts about his ability to lead an army he could hardly communicate with into unknown territory, on the 4th of April, 1883, with 3,200 infantrymen and 300 Albanian cavalrymen, he left Cairo, rendezvoused with another 1,600 troops, led by Brigadier Hussein Mazar, and boarded the steamer ship El Fasha. He headed for the east bank of the White Nile for a short preliminary campaign in the town of Jebalain, where Mahdist forces ordered to take nearby Duaim had amassed. On the 29th of April, after strategically positioning his men at all possible battlefield escape routes, Hicks' militia was met with a full frontal assault by some 4,000 Mahdist warriors, all of whom were subsequently decimated by volleys of disciplined fire. Back in Cairo, the overwhelming victory at Jebelen encouraged policymakers to plan for an even larger Kordofan campaign in the autumn against Ubaid that was again to be led by Colonel William Hicks, who had acquired the nickname Strong Arm among the Sudanese for his gallant preliminary efforts. On the 24th of September 1883, after an exhausting march in temperatures as high as 50 degrees Celsius, Hicks' weakened force of around 15,000 personnel reached their forward base at Duem, where a series of disastrous blunders were made. As a result of a discussion between senior officers, his army would no longer follow the simple Duem Bara Obeid route and would instead take a more circuitous path south, where it was hoped water would be more plentiful while another council of war deemed it wise to abandon the original plan to establish fortified posts in the rear of the advancing army to facilitate the transfer of supplies to the front lines, since they believed poorly trained Egyptian soldiers wouldn't be able to hold such isolated positions. The change in tactics, however, aligned perfectly with the Mahdi's own strategy which involved luring the enemy forward into increasingly empty terrain, picking off any stragglers from the rear and cutting off their supply chain before engaging them in direct confrontation. By the 24th of October, after a month of harassment, internal disagreements, starvation and thirst, the remnants of William Hicks' bedraggled force arrived at Rahad for a much needed rest and injection of supplies, with the next stop being a watering point known as Birka, some 35 miles from Obeid. The Mahdi, well aware of their sluggish progress, having received intel reports twice a day from shadowing scouts and from spies placed inside the government camp, now ordered his forces to take Birka and to continue to ambush and fire upon the enemy as they made their way there, and as William Hicks's doomed and half-dead battalions wearily entered Shai Khan, an inhospitable territory with virtually no water and littered with clusters of thorn bushes with three-inch long spikes. On the 4th of November, as the government made camp in the middle of an unforgiving thorn forest, the Ansar seized the next watering point at Fula al-Nazarin and began preparations for a surprise attack. 
With his militia paraded before him, the Mahdi offered some final words of encouragement to his flock. You will kill this expedition in less than half an hour, because the angels and all the jinns will fight for you. True to his word, the next day the massacre was achieved with terrible swiftness, with large numbers of fearless Mahdist spearmen closing in on all sides. Chaos that was amplified by the sudden emergence of Bagara tribesmen who, having concealed themselves in shallow holes with wooden roofs, now began stabbing those in the central column from behind. Before the day was out, 7,000 of the Egyptian army had been slain at the cost of several hundred Ansar fighters, with William Hicks going bravely to his death with sword in hand after expending all of his ammunition. The Mahdi's success at Fula al-Masrin was compounded later with the capture of Darfur in December, the seizure of Fasha in January 1884, and the assimilation of the eastern and southern provinces of Sudan by April 1884. Emboldened by the incredible progress being made in all his ancillary campaigns, the Mahdi next turned his attention to the most important asset of all, the Sudanese capital of Khartoum. To him, a hotbed of evil, vice, and godlessness that simply had to be purged. Meanwhile, the annihilation of the Hicks mission had stirred a considerable uproar in London, with Prime Minister William Gladstone and his cabinet advocating for the immediate withdrawal of British troops in Sudan, which was deemed not worth the risk. The only further action deemed necessary was to send a rescue mission to extract all the remaining British units marooned in a territory that was no longer of practical use to policymakers in London. Handpicked for the job was Colonel Charles Gordon, a popular military figure who had, in the 1870s, as the Governor General of Khartoum, attempted to eradicate the slave trade in Sudan. After a quick stopover in Cairo in January 1884, in which he was officially appointed Governor General of Sudan by Khadif Turfik, Gordon made an extraordinary proposal, offering the Mahdi a face-to-face -face discussion and the position of Sultan of Kordofan in return for the cessation of his revolution. Sending back a line-by-line -line rebuttal, Muhammad Ahmed completely rejected the terms set out by Gordon, who, in offering his opponent only a political position, had fundamentally misunderstood the religious element that was principally driving the Mahdist revolution. In a furious response, also accompanied by a document outlining the orthodox Muslim case for the rejection of the Mahdi, the humorless Gordon vowed, I am ready for you. I have men here who will cut off your breath. Having arrived in Khartoum on the 18th of February 1884 to much fanfare, one of Gordon's first measures to shore up local support was to permit the owning and selling of slaves, a practical concession that shocked observers back in Britain who knew the general only as an implacable opponent of the slave trade. Elsewhere, Gordon assisted with the evacuation of Europeans and Egyptian officials from the city and revamped the local administration, with senior officials handpicked for a variety of logistical, judiciary, and administrative jobs, while the defensive strategy of Khartoum and the roles its 9,000 defenders would take during the siege were also worked out. The siege of Khartoum officially started on the 13th of March 1884, when Ansar fighters besieged the government fort at Omdurman and engaged the government at Hal Faya, a few miles downstream from Khartoum, to cut off the river route to Berber, offensives which led to the retreat and surrender of government forces. On the 16th of March, Failure befell the defenders again after the betrayal of two of Gordon's senior officers, General Hassan Ibrahim Shalali 
and General Saeed Hussein al-Jim'abi, who purposefully commanded their men to stop firing during the attempted recapture of al fayya crimes for which they were promptly tried and shot by court-martial. By the summer, despite scoring a few minor wins, including the retaking of al fayya Khartoum was surrounded on all sides by the Ansar, who were reportedly so close in some areas that they could see the glow of their enemies' cigarettes and hear their conversations. Completely encircled, Gordon was no longer able to carry out his primary task, which was to evacuate Khartoum and, convinced that London would send him a relief force, he instead resolved to stay and fight, despite declarations from Prime Minister Gladstone that Britain was no longer willing to intervene in Sudan. As the summer turned to early autumn, requests to Qadif Tafik and London for relief either fell on deaf ears, were captured by the Ansar, or didn't even reach them, as was the case of Colonel Stewart, Gordon's trusted deputy who, tasked with hand-delivering papers and detailed reports to the ruling authorities in Britain in September, was caught by tribesmen sympathetic to the Mahdist cause and killed. The documents, which comprehensively outlined Gordon's entire strategy and the amount of supplies left in stores, were seized and then transferred to the Mahdi, who gloated to Gordon in a follow-up letter how we never miss any of your news, nor what is in your innermost thoughts about the strength and support, not of God, on which you rely. We have now understood it all. Gordon's entire plan was now laid bare, but it was a disaster offset by encouraging news received on the 18th of September, which outlined that a rescue mission headed by General Garnet Joseph Wolseley was making its way down the Nile River to Khartoum. Back in London, it had been Wolseley's angry insistence, coupled with the appeals of his colleagues, that had finally persuaded Prime Minister Gladstone to flip on his original policy of non-intervention with the announcement that £300,000 was to be allocated for operations for the relief of General Gordon should they become necessary. Arriving in Egypt on the 9th of September, it took Wolseley's British contingent of 10,500 troops over four hellish months of near-constant fighting to make their way down the Nile through enemy territory to get to Khartoum, making their final push to the city on the 24th of January. Informed that British reinforcements were on their way to buttress the defences of Khartoum, the Mahdi abandoned his months-long effort to coax General Gordon outside of the city walls and started preparing for a full-scale assault. On the evening of the 25th of January, 1885, with all the Ansar assembled at the camp of Abd al-Rahman Wad al-Nujumi, Muhammad Ahmed gave a final address to his jihadi warriors, telling them that in his latest prophetic vision, he had been ordered by the Prophet himself to kill the people of Khartoum before pointing his drawn sword towards the city. With most of the Khartoum residents and sentries asleep, under cover of darkness, the Ansar forces crept forward on their bellies before charging towards the enemy in two fronts with al Nujumi leading from the southwest, with the Begara, the Dihaim, and the Kinana and the Abu Gerja moving in from the east and southeast, with the tribes of the Blue Nile and the Jazira following behind. As the Ansar advanced on the fortified positions, many were killed or injured by caltrops and improvised landmines that had been placed around the perimeter or by artillery fire raining down on the streets of Khartoum, which roused its inhabitants from their slumber. Most of Gordon's utterly demoralized troops put up no resistance and immediately fled into the desert, while those who stayed to fight were slaughtered on the spot. 
With the outer defences collapsed, the centre of Khartoum was mercilessly plundered. Its inhabitants were beheaded, speared, stabbed and shot, while some government officers chose to kill their children and wives before turning the gun on themselves to prevent their kin from being abused and butchered by the rebel forces. Refusing to escape upriver on a steamer that had been prepared for him, Gordon stayed with his men, directing a last-ditch defence as Ansar warriors swarmed into his residence. Identified on the rooftop, the Honourable General was killed instantly by a shot through the chest, with his decapitated head being strung up later in the marketplace to serve as a warning to others. The Mahdi finally ordered a stop to the killing at 5 p.m., after which affluent male survivors of fighting age who had survived the bloodbath were tortured to reveal the hiding places of any stashed wealth, with particularly bad treatment reserved for the Shagia, a tribe that had colluded with the government for decades, whose tribesmen, when found alive, were horrifically abused. With every single priceless treasure or artifact looted, the Mahdi triumphantly entered the city on the 6th of February to inspect the bounty, before making his way to a cemetery near Kalakla Gate to see his mother's grave, which he hadn't visited in several years. In total, the siege of Khartoum lasted a staggering 317 days, and upon its conclusion, the Mahdi was now the undisputed leader of a vast empire stretching from the Red Sea to the plains of Darfur and from the swamps and jungles of the Bar al-Ghazal to Dongola. Muhammad Ahmed wasted no time in consolidating his ascendant position, almost immediately ordering his generals to crush the troublemaking tribes of the Nuba Mountains and to vanquish the government presence in the holdout settlements of Sanaa, Gasala, and Suakin. In fact, in the five months after the cessation of hostilities, Muhammad Ahmed would send out over 300 letters and proclamations to his generals, judges, and bureaucrats as the foundations of the Mahdist state and its social, military, and administrative structures began to take shape. In the meantime, the ever-ambitious Mahdi now planned the second stage of his jihad, the conquest of Egypt, in addition to considering the best ways he could extend his rule into the ripe territories of Morocco to the northwest and Abyssinia to the south. On the 16th of June 1885, however, Mohammed Ahmed suddenly fell ill with a severe fever and was promptly confined to his quarters at Omdurman with a high temperature, a rash, abdominal pains, and extreme vomiting. The quick onset of the symptoms caused many to suspect poisoning or meningitis, yet it was more likely that he had contracted typhus fever caused by exposure to rat fleas, probably exacerbated by the unhygienic conditions in and around Khartoum. As the Mahdi lay dying, and as his followers anxiously recited the verse of purity from the Quran, usually spoken in times of distress, he attempted to distract himself with the business of ruling. But by the 20th of June, he had deteriorated so rapidly that he was unable to compose any more letters. On Monday, the 22nd of June, 1885, Surrounded by his most loyal followers, his deputies, and the grieving prostrate figure of his primary wife, Aisha Umm al mu Ummunin, Muhammad Ahmed the Mahdi passed away aged 41, having established a caliphate that would only last less than 15 years. The son of a humble boat builder with a divine claim, Muhammad Ahmed experienced a religious awakening in his early years, impressing his teachers and mentors with the discipline and seriousness with which he approached Islam in a period that was also marked 
by the tragic death of his father and a growing loathing for the abusive central Egyptian government and the sliding religious standards of the ulama. Infatuated by the Sufi interpretation of Islam, by the time he was 17, he pledged himself as an acolyte of Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif Nur al-Daim, master of the Samania order in al kawa where Ahmed would spend the next seven years of his life as a dedicated servant of God, performing feats of remarkable devotion and mastering Sharia law and the theological doctrine. Graduating, having forged a reputation for extreme religious dedication, he used his early clout to establish his own mosque and following on the shores of Jazira Abba, from where, over the next few years, his power and fame would gradually grow. Embarking on a preaching tour around the Sudanese countryside and emboldened by the crowds of people listening intently to his words, in a series of fiery sermons, Ahmed began denouncing the central Egyptian government for their corruption, the opening up of the country to foreign influence, and the lax religious standards of the orthodox ulama. Inspired by his words, before long, people from all over the country were flocking to join his cause, convinced the Prophet's chosen one walked among them. In June 1881, following a period of intense prayer, meditation and reflection, Muhammad Ahmed announced to the world that he was the Mahdi of prophecy. Building a successful coalition of tribes, Ahmed was able to launch a devastating rebellion in Sudan that eventually resulted in the collapse of Egyptian and British presence in the region. Outgunned and without advanced weapons, Ahmed and his forces found success time and time again, despite the odds stacked against them. In a very real way, Ahmed had begun the restoration of an Islamic caliphate in the face of intense resistance from outside Egyptian and British forces. What do you think of Muhammad Ahmed? Was he a noble and selfless defender of the Islamic faith who justifiably fought against an abusive government? Or was he a self-deluded and egotistical individual more interested in the trappings of power than the purity of Islam? Please let us know in the comment section. And in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. There is no purchase necessary. Simply follow the link to download and play Enlisted for free. Play Enlisted on PC, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox One and Xbox Series X and Series S. Follow the link to download the game and get your exclusive bonus of three days of premium time and several orders for troops and weapons now. See you in battle.